Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Green and White, brought to you by Argyle Life. I'm John, in for Aaron as host today, as we discuss a pair of Christmas crackers stuffed full of festive fun uh, and other football cliches. In a bit, we'll tick off our Christmas car diff list by discussing our Boxing Day Desmond in Wales, with two goals from Wits ending in a draw. But first, and talking of Wits ends, we'll look back on last night's trip to the Solent, where Ryan Hardy's late burst of Bazball offered solace, but not a quantum of points as the Saints <laughs> marched to a 2-1 win. Bally Mumba scored a perfectly good goal that was, of course, disallowed. A soulless robot in the stand casts its eye over the incident. But enough of our Prime Minister will be asking should there be VAR in the Championship. So we need to discuss are the James Beatty to my David Connolly. It's Dan Ellard. Who writes these, honestly? Uh, I actually write them for Aaron as well. No, I'm kidding. I don't. Um, but I did write that. <laughs> um, uh, the Neil Warnock to my Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. It's Joe Bell. I would say we're in London, aren't we? But we can't really class Southampton as London. So just going to have to get on with it. Um, yes. Good Hi. evening. Glad you to be back. On, you can based on accents, in my opinion. Uh, and finally, yeah. the Ian Duncan Smith to my William Hague. It's Sam Down. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Good evening. And so, uh, yeah, as I said, we're going to discuss the games in reverse order, um, just because obviously last night is fresher. And I think there might just be uh, one or two more things to talk about from the Southampton game than the Cardiff one. Um, and Sam, I'll start with you, since I think aside from myself, you were the only person uh, in this in this podcast at the moment who was actually present at St. Mary's last night. Give us your rundown of the game. Um, yeah, I feel obviously very disappointed. I didn't go into the game expecting anything from it whatsoever. To be honest, I thought it was going to be like like Leicester and, and, and like Leeds, whereby we went behind early and just didn't regain it. That, that was just the anticipation I had going into the game. As it turned out, the first 10 minutes made, made me think I was all the more right in that. We were really under the caution. Hazard made a great save early doors to keep it at nil-nil. Uh, he was it also nearly lobbed from 40 yards. Um, but they, they really piled on the pressure that first 10. And I thought this is only a matter of time. But we really settled into it after that. Really started to play well. Started to defend well, primarily. And even occasionally going forward. We had a couple of the 3v3s that we maybe didn't make that much of. But we really were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And we weren't letting them have any cheap opportunities. We weren't letting them have any chance of the goal. Again, after that first 10. I uh, just felt going towards half time. I, you know, we've got a bit of a chance here. They're getting a bit frustrated. And if we had Hardy on for the counter attacks rather than Wayne, um, no disrespect to him, could have a bit more end product on the end of them. Second half started, and and, I, and again we we were just, we were really getting into it a bit more. We were getting forward more. Um, and and then obviously comes the incident that we're all going to talk about, which. Let's just say that I think we scored a completely legitimate goal. I'm sure we'll go on to it in more detail in the ref watch, but that really absolutely should have been 1-0 up. Uh, and that would have, I think, been, a, you know, maybe not deserved in the context of XG and the balance of play, but it would have been deserved in the sense that it would have been a, a just reward for a really good fighting performance against, on paper, a, a much better team. Um, and then, yeah, then... It, within about maybe 20 or 20 seconds of the Green Army realising and stopping celebrating, not even that, they break forward. Uh, they kind of do us at our own game and they, they, they hit up, despite having them having dominated possession for most of the game, their first goal came from a counter-attack, didn't it? Um, Charlie Alcatraz, um, really good finish, really great curling finish, Hazard, absolutely no yeah, chance for Alcatraz. it. That, that, yeah, yeah, he did, Charlie he did Alcatraz. Well to his he did well to escape our defence there, didn't he? Yeah, that was, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, so, yeah, a bit tongue-tied. Charlie Alcaraz uh, with a with a great curling finish on the break uh, into the top corner. Hazard had absolutely no chance. Um, and then after that, I, th I, think, I think we were just a bit unsettled. There was that feeling of anger. There was that feeling of a bit of a punch to the stomach. And for about five to ten minutes after going 1-0 down, before going 2-0 down, I thought we were quite poor. We, we had even, you know, maybe in that in that time frame, we had a couple of counters that didn't quite happen. But but overall, I felt the defence defensive side of things was very lack um, lackadaisical during that time. Um, 
and and then they, they they scored a second, which I felt was only a matter of time. Um, again, with, with with ironically a bit of a counter attack, although they were so possession dominated, their their two goals came on the break, which I thought was a bit of a maybe a bit of a statistical anomaly. But Hazard get caught a bit in no man's land, doesn't really know whether to come out for it or not. And I think when he's when he's finally realised he's sort of caught between two approaches, it's it's too late, and and there we go, it's two 0 Then we you know at that point where. We're really throwing everything at the hope of getting a result and bringing a lot of attacking subs. And we're, we're kind of banging on the door a little bit at that point. Um, they're still frustrating us. They're still keeping the ball, but there's a lot more attacking urgency. And then Vazenu makes a complete howler. Goodness knows what he's doing. Um, and then Hardy makes it 2-1. Bizarrely, after that point, I felt we didn't really do anything after 2-1. And that wasn't necessarily because we, we stopped trying or, or, you know, or, or anything like that. But it was because I think Southampton just realised, hang on a minute, we could lose this win here. And they, they stepped up their game a bit and they kept the ball very well through stoppage times. So you have to say, from a, from a game management point of view, that was absolutely superb for Southampton, how well they responded to us getting that goal back. Because you've seen it so many times whereby a team, get, like in, in the Leeds game, I'm sure Dan will test early this season, where we got one back through Wayne, Leeds really panicked. Um, we still didn't score, but, but Leeds panicked. And Southampton didn't do that at all. They really managed the game well and stayed calm and they didn't really let us have a sniff to be honest, after getting that consolation goal. So, yeah, they, they were the better team. Obviously, they've got more quality than us. I don't think anybody can deny that. But then so they should do with their their squad and their budget compared to ours. It would have been a real shock if they didn't have more quality than us. So, in that set, in one sense, you have to say maybe they deserve their win. But in another sense, we put in a really resolute away performance, did well in a, in a lot of ways. And um, if not for, I think, an a officiating howler, would have gone one nil up. And at that point, maybe we don't win the game, maybe we do certainly feel the chances we lose the game are, are much reduced because if, not, if nothing else, there wouldn't be that direct counter-attack for the first goal. Um, and, and then, you know, we could have just dug in. I think their fans would have got frustrated, would have got on their back a little bit. And that's before we even mentioned a, a very borderline penalty appeal on Hardy, which was, I think, at 2-0 down. You know, if we got back to 2-1 earlier in the game, we could have had more of a chance of going for the equaliser. Yeah, not our night, but some uh, reasons to be positive. Yeah, I was surprised to see uh, Alcatraz being a kind of nippy winger because I I was under the impression he was more of a rock at the back. Oh, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I won't leave this one down easily when I just slip of the tongue. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get out of jail um, with that one, Sam. Oh, <laughs> very good. Obviously, normally we do Joe Bell's ref watch segment somewhat later in in a given podcast, but I think we're going to go straight into that now because um, that pretty much was all any Argyle fan was talking about. Um, from my point of view, I was in the ground. I was actually the only one in our sort of immediate group who actually saw Mumba put his head in his hands. Everyone else was going absolutely berserk. I just happened to glance over and see that he wasn't celebrating anymore and was like, really? You know, it didn't really seem to make sense to me because it seemed very clear that he'd run from deep and and got on the end of the cross but obviously being behind the goal I didn't want to have a look at a replay of it or a still of it um uh, you know just in case I was wrong um but yes the the still quickly circulated uh among the people in the away end uh using uh, Southampton's free wi-fi in the stadium which was uh, I thought an excellent touch um but anyway the still image quickly was uh, passed around um very clearly Mumble was onside um and, and my initial reaction from behind the goal was vindicated. So, Joe, I guess the first question for Ref Watch then, uh, before and I'm sure you'll have much more to say, is how, if I can see that it's not offside from not level with play after drinking four pints, can a professional uh, assistant referee not see the same? Only he will be able to answer that question, John. Unfortunately, I can't um, because, as you say, that the decision itself doesn't actually need too much of a discussion because there is absolutely no argument to be had in the official's defence. It is very clearly onside. He's even got a bit of whitewash painted on the turf to help him with this decision. Um, I, th- I mean, it, it's ba- it's, and it, it goes back to a broader point, really, that when you are the little club in the big pond, you know, we've had so long where we were the big fish in the small pond, it, it, it's roles reversed now that when you go away to these big clubs and these big grounds, you need every slice of luck to go your way. And unfortunately, at the moment, it isn't going our way in respect of refereeing decisions. The linesman was 
probably kept up with play about as much as I've ever kept up with play myself when I used to play in school. Um, all the way through the first half, he was he was guessing the offsides against Southampton. Now, I believe he certainly got one of them right, but I could definitely see an argument that he quite clearly got one of the ones wrong that he immediately flagged on the Southampton um, attacker. I think it might have been Shea Adams. And that sort of led you to think at half-time, well, you know, he's he's not necessarily one you want to trust. And we knew that Hardy was going to come on and stretch the game second half. We knew what our out ball was. Um, so it was always in the back of your mind, look, I didn't expect that it would the deci- the next decision that he would make would have such a big bearing on this game. As Sam says, you know, we were we were second best in the game. Nobody can argue that. No you're folly if you try and come up with an argument to say that we weren't. But the fact of the matter is is that we have scored a perfectly legitimate goal that completely changes the entire context of the rest of the game. We're all, all we're right. We're we're defending well. We're holding on to the point and the clean sheet we've got. But if we're suddenly holding on to three points with the players that we've got available to bring off the bench to make us a little bit more solid at the back, I can't quite get my head around it. And you know, Neil Jusnip then obviously brings up the argument. Well, hang on a minute. We also had three players behind the ball when the restart was taken. Now, I understand why he's disappointed. The referee didn't stop that and tell Southampton to wait but there's a part of me that also thinks well hang on a minute we've got to be switched on here we've been switched on for the previous 56 minutes as soon as that flag goes up right get back into position and get back up the field um so I can see his argument but I mean I'm I'm just more more aggrieved with the offside because it's you can you genuinely cannot offer a case in the defense of the linesman the worst thing is I think when you see the um, screen grab that Sky Sports put up on their social media last night, which was Don Goodman lose, losing the plot, essentially, on co-commentary at how can he possibly flag Barley Mumba offside, is the linesman's starting position. He is actually goal side of Bednarek. So he's the wrong side of Bednarek than actually Mumba is. So with the angle that he had, He's always going to flag Mumba offside. That's not Barley Mumba's fault. That's the linesman's fault for not getting back up with play and getting in the right position. His starting position is all wrong. He's always all he can see then is Mumba and Bednarek, and Mumba looks in an abnormal position. But the fact of the matter is, he has guessed. He cannot genuinely come off that field and go to the assessor at full time and said, "I back the courage of my convictions. I'm hundred percent right that that's offside." I, he cannot ha- he cannot say that, but as with all referees and all linesmen, he'll be rewarded with another game on Monday in the second tier of English football, and it will just get brushed under the carpet. We'll get another letter of apology from the PGMOL or the FA, EFL, whoever it is it comes from. But what good's that? It, it's completely changed. It's not. Let me stop myself there. It's not changed the game. It's not changed the course of the game because. Southampton had, we know what Southampton were capable of. We know how good they were in this game. So that there's every likelihood that they would have gone on to win it anyway. But it's completely changed how we would have gone about the next 35 minutes. And the one thing that leaves the real sour taste in the mouth is it is just 27 seconds between Bali Mumba heading that ball into the back of the net and Alcaraz is bending one past Hazard. It is such such a tough decision to take and it it probably won't sit right for a long time but I mean we were executing the game plan to almost perfection up to that point I mean Jews nip hit the nail on the head you know you just feel so sorry for the players because the, the one thing you can't say is they lacked the quality and not the ability they just lacked the quality to compete with Southampton on the pitch in a football match last night but they outdid Southampton in character and fight and spirit and everything you want from a group of players. And they were so badly let down by people who unfortunately aren't accountable for their actions. Managers are accountable for poor decisions. Players are accountable for poor mistakes, but referees aren't. And I understand that referees need support and they need help, but 
when there are so many bad decisions happening on a regular basis. I mean, I, I saw some of the clips from other games last night in and around the Football League. There were some howling decisions in some of the games. There were some awful ones at the weekend. And, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll come on to a broader point if, if John allows it in a minute about the standard of refereeing in the championship. But that decision last night, it, I'll never be able to shake it, I don't think, because it just had such a big bearing on the end result. You mentioned accountability at PAFC. Max tweeted to, uh, tweeted to ask, what can be done to hold officials accountable? Interviews, maybe? Just too many excuses for their numerous mistakes. Just very quickly, what what would a what would an interview have done if if James Linnington or the linesman come out at full time and said, you know, all right, we've we hold our hands up, we make a mistake. What difference does that make? It's not going to make Neil Jewsnip or the players feel any better. I understand the question. I'd love for a referee to come out at the end of a big game. If you know, I'd have loved at the end of the Man United Liverpool game the other week for Michael Oliver to come out and explain why he sent Dallow off at full time. That's the sort of thing that needs a discussion. This sort of thing, it alone, it would only add fuel to our fire had the linesman or the referee came out last night and explained that decision because there's no way they could have defended it, in my opinion. Um, Sam, it looks like you uh, are about to jump Yeah, um, I think there's a really underrated point here at the standard of refereeing in the championship, which is that um, the championship aren't getting the best in the business referees as much as they used to because they're all turned up at Stockley Park because whereas the Premier League would have previously just required a referee and a fourth official and two assistants, it now requires a referee, a fourth official, two assistants and then numerous other people sat behind the screen at Stockley Park. So naturally, you know, refereeing football matches is very tough and particularly in this modern day and age, the pace of the game is, is electrically fast and I think you really get a sense of that watching it at pitch level or, or nearer to pitch level rather than high up in the gods. And it, it's just so quick to keep up with. And the level of physical fitness and and eyesight and awareness and all the rest of it to judge these split-second decisions is generally very tough. Now, look, I think last night's one was a, a bit of a stinker that, that probably, as John said, he, he got from up in the stands um, a little bit worse to drink, whereas some of the other ones are a lot more borderline, I grant you. But, but the point is that, generally speaking, Standard of refereeing, it, it, it does appear to be quite poor at the moment, but I think, for one, it's an age of increased media scrutiny, whereas back in the previous day, stuff didn't go all around Twitter so much, you didn't necessarily notice all of the, the errors. But also, I think it is it is just a much higher pace, higher tempo game, and, and referees are tied up in VAR, which further values the product of the Premier League in theory. I think in reality, it makes it worse, but in theory, it means they're putting all the refereeing resources into the Premier League. And really devaluing the product of the EFL accordingly from that. So I think that there aren't easy answers. I think to an extent, to an extent, you have to accept mistakes happen. Um, without wanting to relitigate it, I certainly think the Coventry one is so much more borderline than people think as to whether the ball was overhanging the line. But um, without without wanting to relitigate it, let me make that clear. But the, the one last night was, was just so clear. Not only is he onside, he's doubly onside. Because Bednarek is really leaning back and the entire back half of his body is playing him on. But you've also got the trailing leg of um, the number 21. Ah, oh, he's got a double barreled name. I can't remember. Is it Harvard something or other? Yeah, him. The, the, the trailing leg of, of, of him is, is playing, it's also playing with Bron. So he's actually doubly onside rather than just onside. So Harvard Bellis's leg and Bednarek's entire back half of his body are both playing number on. So yeah, that's just a really, really poor decision. And I do feel that I saw a great tweet going around that if 85% of decisions are correct, we seem to be suffering from all of the other 15. Because the amount of borderline ones that have just not gone our way, that have, or at least might have massively influenced the result, are huge. Look, the Coventry one I think is borderline, but you, you, that's an arguably one that could so easily have gone the other way. Obviously, the Bundu one at uh, Ipswich, Plenty of others. Um, yeah, very. Uh, Birmingham, Birmingham with Dembele not being sent off in the first half when he should have been. Loads it's of them. Funny loads you of them. Say, it's funny you should say that, Sam, because um, earlier on today, I, I did a little bit of constructive analysis on uh, uh, all okay. of the league games that we have played this season. Now, I don't want this to turn into a massive guilt trip where fans of other championship clubs get their little violins out and start playing My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion or something on their, on their bow and bow and strings but i'm just going to rattle you off just a select few 
of key decisions that have gone against us this year. So we've already had the Mumba goal last night. At least one, probably two red cards in the first half against Rotherham. There's certainly one, and that completely changes the entire course of that game. Uh, Coventry, where the ball is out of play, now I understand that's a subjective decision, but when you hear the referee come off and tell our management that half of the ball was in play, well, I don't know how he's got that idea. Um, and that tells me all I needed to know about the officiating team that were on display that night. Ipswich away, where George Edmondson should have been sent off when the score is, what, 1-0 one, one Argyle? And Edmondson <coughs> should have been sent off? That completely changes the game. You could throw it, and then that's just to name a few, you could throw in... Birmingham away. Dan Scar is quite clearly fouled in the build-up to their opening goal. That's even before you get into subjective ones where should Dominic Iorf have been sent off for Sheffield Wednesday at home when Whitaker's threw on goal and he's hacked down on the edge of the box? Should Shay Charles have picked up two yellow cards at home park in the space of about six minutes against Southampton earlier in the season? Preston's second goal at Deepdale when Centre forward, the, the big lad, stood in front of Connor Hazard as Miller takes his shot and it goes into the far corner. He's deliberately interfering with play. You've got other ones. Kesler Hayden be, being forearm smashed in the neck. And, you know, don't get me wrong. This isn't just a guilt trip because there are decisions that haven't gone other teams' way. For Kundal's tackle against Sunderland. Mikhail Miller probably should have been sent off at home to um, Middlesbrough when he, he dragged the lad down by his shoulders. There's also Dan Scar could have potentially been sent off at home to Southampton. But the fact of the matter is, I've probably listed about seven or eight decisions there. Oh, Swansea's third goal, again, I know it was very late in the game, probably should have been ruled out for a foul as well. I mean, it's it's just, it's baffling. And, you know, I, I actually made the point to somebody today. All the way through last season, I know things went our way, but I don't ever recall too many moments where I sat there thinking, God, we've got away with one there. Maybe, for example, the obvious one that springs to mind is the Azaz penalty at home to Derby, where you think, oh, that's a bit soft. But I don't I don't remember too many games last season where I sat there thinking, God, that's, that decision not going our way, that penalty or that red card or something has completely changed the game. It seems to be happening every other week in a league where the referees are professional. I Not just, the good days of Jamil Matt so headbutting a Pompey crazy. player and getting away with it. <laughs> but this this goes back to the earlier point I made, Sam, that when we were in League One, League Two, we were the bigger fish in the small pond. Now that we've stepped into the championship, and a lot of people don't like hearing it because it gives them a complex about just how big Argyle are, we are a small club in this league. We're a big club in our region. We're a small club in this league. And when you're going to grounds like Southampton against teams like that, when the game is panning out the way it is, you need those little breaks. And yet again, as with just a few of those games I listed off before I threw that away, before I started weeping into that list, it didn't go our way. I'm going to stop now because poor Dan's not said a word yet. You know, it's important to note that all fans have frustrations with referees. Fans of most clubs feel like there's an agenda against their team, uh, some more than others, <laughs> at least United. But, um, you know, in, I think in our case, it really does transcend that. And I think Joe has, has obviously outlined that very well. Um, and to my mind, it's now three away games in particular, where at a key moment, we've been the victim of one of the worst decisions you are ever likely to see. And I do include the commentary uh, ball being out. Sorry, Sam, in that one, I think that... The re the, the, and, and, and I, don't, I don't want to really get it. I'm aware of your view on it, but I think the fact that all the players, the fact that all the players stopped, is um, while very unprofessional and they shouldn't have done it. Absolute evidence that it was very, very clearly just out. Very of the quickly, in the same, just very quickly same on that point. How many Southampton players put their hand up for offside yesterday when Mumba put that ball in the back of the net? Yeah, the Mumba Watch decision. Back. Is... Not a single one of them. The, the Mumba decision is, is a terrible one as well, and then the, the Ipswich one. Um, but, but that makes for a trio of games where, who, yeah, who knows what would have happened afterwards, but three away games that I sincerely believe we could have gone on to win, including against two of the best teams in the league, uh, if those decisions had gone in our favour. Um, so we've talked about that at some length. I do want to give Dan an opportunity to weigh in if he has anything new to say on the uh, refereeing imbroglio yesterday. Um, Let's move on, shall we? Yes. So... 
Dan, I was going to ask you about Southampton, actually, because we've obviously talked a lot about ourselves. Um, and I think one of the very frustrating things for me, very much like going into the Ipswich game, actually, is I kind of assumed that we would get smashed last night. And I had a great day out. It was probably my favourite away day of the season in, in many respects. I had a good night out afterwards. Um, if we'd lost that game 2 or 3 nil to what was clearly an outstanding side, I don't think I'd have had too many complaints. And it just feels once again, like a very bitter pill to swallow that we've been cheated rather than being beaten fair and square. That being said, um, I thought Southampton were very good. And I remember sitting with you uh, inside Home Park when we played them in the third game of the season, um, where they also beat us 2-1. So it was the same result. Jay Adams, again, getting the winner in that <laughs> one after, uh, well, and, and also a game that featured a Ryan Hardy goal for us. Um, so a lot of similarities on paper. But I, th I personally thought we were playing a very different Southampton side last night. Um, but I was uh, curious as, as to what you would make of it after watching them in the flesh uh, earlier in the season and then on TV last night. Yeah, I, it did make the very bad refereeing decision slightly more bearable. The fact that they were a very, very good team and, and as, as others have said, deserved to beat us, to be honest. Um, it is another uh, kind of reminder of, of what we're up against at this league, just the quality they've got in that team, you know. Dozy was just tying Edwards in knots. I mean, we tried to kind of stay compact and, you know, we'd have um, a centre mid or a winger kind of help him out so he wasn't left one-on-one -on -one with him. But at the same time, it was just, you know, um, lambs to the slaughter. And that's nothing against Joe Edwards. He did his job pretty well. But, um, and, and many others, you know, Adams is a very good striker at this level. Armstrong, Walker-Peters, Alcaraz is a cheat code at this level. He really is. So it's, they, they, they are a very good team and it, and it, it does show, I think, the fact that um, the fact that Leeds also beat us 2-1, but as you said, panicked quite a bit more. Sorry, Sam said panicked quite a bit more than Southampton did is probably reflective in their current positions in the league table. I know Leeds were above Southampton or level with Southampton for a bit, but Southampton are now pulling clear. And I think it just shows a little bit more... Um, ability as a team, whilst I do think that Leeds have even more quality uh, within their players as individuals than Southampton do. Um, so they will, um, they'll be right up there uh, towards the end of the season. Uh, obviously, they're closing the gap on, on Ipswich at the minute. Uh, Leicester look clear at the top, but uh, who knows, you know, Sheffield Wednesday looked clear at the top for a fair, fair while last season, didn't they? As well as we stuck to our task, and for an hour we stuck to our task very, very well in terms of being compact, um, defending central areas well, um, doubling up on on um, key players as much as we could, and and um, and just the defender, the back three, just heading out everything and blocking everything that they could. I thought all three of them were absolutely brilliant last night. Southampton did find a way in the end. It, it's galling that it was in the circumstance that it was, but, you know, they, they might well have found a way in the end anyway. Um, it's uh, it's a credit to us that we that we held them out for so long because, yeah, they're a, they're a very, very good team. Yeah, I um, have I've long been a, a big fan of Russell Martin and I guess I wavered a little bit earlier in the season where they had that run of games where, they were trying to pass the ball out from the back with religious fervor and kept getting it wrong. And I think lost four or five games in a row. Um, but I think yesterday really shows why he is an outstanding young managerial talent. Mm. I thought they looked so well coached. Um, and Sam and yeah. I have had this debate offline and won't recapitulate it here. But compared to, say, Leicester, when we played them, where I felt like it was a team that were it was really a collection of outstanding individuals. That Southampton team, some of the passages of play were the players were just so on each other's wavelength and the movement of the ball was so quick. I think, I think for me, and obviously maybe there are issues with the fact they've only won the game 2-1 and obviously the outcome could have been different does suggest some failures, but, but I, but well, I really seriously think that is the best team that I have personally seen us play this season, just in terms of the performance on the night against, against us. I thought they were superb. Well, I would also add that, you know, with all that quality that I've mentioned, all those quality players and a quality team, you know, there's a lot of Premier League quality in that squad. Um, one thing that does slightly hold them back is the fact that they've got a League One standard goalkeeper. Um, better than Mike Cooper? He's not, is he? How much, <laughs> was it 15 million they spent on him? I, I know there's a bit of a... 17, I think, reported. 17 million. Dan's getting, Dan's getting clipped up here, but I would like to say that when I was clipped up 
earlier in the season for saying that he has a reputation for being clumsy. Some Southampton fans in our mentions were furious uh, with that with that take. Who obviously hadn't watched him uh, in any of his previous jobs or indeed playing for them last season. And and I think yeah, the look, he's, the last he's, minute... he's very good. He's very good with the ball at his feet. No, generally, and his kicking, his passing accuracy is very good. But you know, the number of gaffes he makes is just like, how can that be? in accordance with a with a goalkeeper that you want to be playing in the Premier League. Um I I I don't get it. And I genuinely believe whilst I know Mike Cooper's been injured a lot and in you know might have regressed a little bit uh in that time over the past kind of year, um I, I think he's better than Bazanu without a shadow of a doubt. And Dan will be enjoying his interactions with Southampton Twitter uh, later. Um, Dan, sticking with you, um, just uh, sort of finally, before we uh, want to go to some listener comments and, and questions, um, talking of errors, uh, there's been some debate online about exactly who was at fault for the goal that ultimately proved to be the winner, which has got a bit lost in all of our analysis, given, given the focus on the you know, the Hardy goal and obviously the Mumba incident and subsequent strike from, from Alcaraz. It seems to be very ponderous defending from the entire back line. And there are also people saying they think Hazard should have come out and, and, and you know, uh, taken charge of the situation better than he did. It did seem remarkably easy for Adams to prod the ball into the net. What was your, you know, analysis of that goal, watching it back with a bunch of replays on, on TV? Yeah, it was a good run to get in behind. And it was just a shame that, you know, at, at nil nil, we were so good at just remaining goal side and not letting them get that space in behind. Whereas obviously at one nil down, we had to push out. We had to be more adventurous, press higher up the pitch, chase the game a bit more. And as a result, they get in behind us. Look, Adams is very strong. Um, and I think, you know, he, he kind of holds off the defender well. It's, it's, yeah, it's a bit frustrating that he kind of has the amount of time that he does. And yeah, Hazard... Look, I'm, I'm not going to say he should charge out and just kind of potentially like just wipe him out or something, but it does kind of just stand there a little bit. There was a goal that Andre Onana conceded, actually. Um, I forget which game it was, a couple of weeks ago, where, again, it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one situation and he just kind of stands there and it's like, come on, mate, like come out, make yourself a bit bigger, you know, mate, rather than just giving him a corner to slot the ball into. It was a little bit like that for me. Um, yeah, so... It's it's not a howler from anyone. Um, I would say more, less so than I think Adam Randall for the first goal is caught a it's just a little bit too deep. I think he needs to press out a little bit more and, and close down Alcaraz. Um, so yeah, it's it's not a howler from anyone uh, that second goal. But it, yeah, it, it is one that you kind of look at and think could that have been preventable. Um, indeed. Moving on to some uh, listener comments about the game and then some questions to put to you all. Um, Richard uh, O, or Alf, apologies for uh, the pronunciation there, O-U-G-H, uh, says, unpopular for me to say this. Yes, we should have had two goals, but I felt overall we were second best. It was two too late in the game when we started to really get on top of things. Set up was too negative for too long. Um, not sure if that is an entirely unpopular opinion, given the uh, consensus that we've had as to our second bestness. Um, James Smith says, as a point of positivity, our hardest away game is now behind us and we have consistently improved. Time for that playoff push to start. Um, I did see a, a graphic going around uh, yesterday showing that we have played all of the top current top half bar Sunderland away from home already I would personally caveat that with the fact that the top top half in the championship with the exception of the top five or six teams can change pretty much wholesale from week to week given how congested the uh, midfield seeded batch is as some uh, fellow podcasters like to call it but but a good point nonetheless we have now been to all of the, the clear top four sides in the league as well as West Brom who look in decent nick um dan says if mumba's not this one different dan says if mumba's goal stood it would have been a very different game don't mind losing but when a bad decision from the officials contributes towards that it's very hard to take uh tom harris says the game plan worked to a t just the lino wasn't having it swansea had no manager and crumbled at st mary's two days ago we've gone there and got very close to taking a point lots to be positive about um, and uh, yeah, a lot of uh, other comments about the official, uh, the officials and the decision, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, moving on to some questions then. Um, Ryan has said, I think you'll discuss the goal, which we have the goal in heavily inverted commas. Um, he also talked about the new formation, which looks to have made us more solid, but still conceded four goals in two games. So has it really? Um, I think we'll come on to some of the particular incidents from the Cardiff game. 
um, in in the second half of the pod. But um, Sam, I know you've you've been talking a lot about um, formations on this podcast over the course of the season. Um, obviously, in his first in their first game in caretaker charge, Chusnip and, and Nanskiville sort of stuck with a four at the back. But we have then gone away from home twice and played a back three. Um, what have you made of that of that change? Um, well, I've been advocating for it for a long time. It, it's very tough that our last three games of playing that formation, including the Leeds game, obviously under Schumacher, were, were Leeds away, Southampton away, and Cardiff away, which are all away games to top half teams, including two of the top four. So it's a, whilst we only got one point from those three games and conceded obviously two goals in each of those games, which may make you think the formation isn't the right one. It's an incredibly tough sample size. So if you'd have played that formation in some of the more winnable games, um, th- then I think it could it could have fared a lot better. Um, I, I still think that, that it's a very much a formation we can and should get a lot of use out of. Maybe I, I might have been a little bit hasty in, in my you know assumption. I've been saying all season that, that, on, that it should that, just be. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound like you. No, not, not at all. But I may have been a little hasty in just saying that this is absolutely our, our only formation we should play and the thought the bat shouldn't, be, shouldn't even be considered because I can see that there are some advantages to thought the bat. We, we tend to dominate the play a little bit more um, play, playing thought the bat because we've got the extra man in the midfield. Whereas with the 3-4-3, three, three, it in theory makes us more solid at the back. Obviously, look, we can't account too much for the, the um, Matt Butcher own goal, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a minute. Um, and, and you can't too much account for some of the individual errors in, in the Leeds game, like Kessler Hayden deciding to pass the ball to Dan James, who was completely unmarked at the edge of the box to slot at home. So some of it is, is individual bloopers rather than being just structurally easier to break down with, with, with that formation, for sure. So look, I still think 3 4 3 has a big part to play. But then again, you know, I, I can't completely ignore the evidence. Maybe, just maybe, it's not the answer to all our prayers either maybe we do just need to balance the, the two formations a little bit um and, and maybe it, it is just true that we're going to be a decent if very flawed side whichever of those formations we play and i think that's probably the fairest and most unbiased answer i can give um positive to take from that i certainly think the main positive i will say and this is certainly true in the cardiff game is when we do get forward we just look so much more natural. The interchange, everyone knows where everyone's meant to be there. The link up down the left-hand side with Mumba or Miller as the wing-back um, just, just looks really natural. They, they can come in, they can cause danger inside the box. I think Kedzle Hayden, um, as you showed with Cardiff, definitely suits being a wing-back more than he suits being a, a, a full-back. Um, and I, I think the um, you, you have the two inside forwards who can you know, um, really overload the penalty areas um, or, or, or or even they can interchange. Like if, say, somebody like Mumba wants to really get into the box, um, whoever is the wide left forward, be it, be it Callum Wright or be it Azab, can, can go further out wide and offer a wide option to counter the interlap. And it's that constant movement, constant interchange. Um, when John just talked about Southampton players being on each other's wavelength and, and those natural patterns of play, I just feel that certainly in the attacking sense, the patterns of play and the natural interchange we get in a 3-4-3 is a lot better to what we get in a 4-3-3. But the, the, the trade-off of that is, that is that we don't dominate as much play. So whilst the patterns of play when we get there are better, we probably get it into that final third less. And also defensively, it's probably much of a much receiver way so my very my very uh, long-winded answer to, to, to summarize is that um I'm, I'm still relatively in favor of it but i'm perhaps less um evangelical of it evangelical of it than i once was if that's fair to say indeed um last night also saw returns to the action for ryan hardy and mustafa Bundu both on as substitutes, which I think is um, something that maybe we would not have predicted would happen after watching, I guess, particularly Bundu um, stretch it off with a horrific looking injury against Rotherham. I think many of us will have seen the photos of the gash in his uh, shin, um, which was uh, a tackle that deserved a yellow card, according to that day's referee, as Joe touched on earlier. Yes, good to see those two back uh, so quickly from injury. Um 
And uh, obviously, yes, but, but 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 coming on in the second half, Sam's got me all hot under the collar here. Um, coming on in the second half uh, with Ben Wayne once again starting. Uh, Alex, A-L-L-E-X, uh, Alex, uh, says, talk about the difference Hardy makes. So, uh, Joe, would you like to talk about the difference Hardy makes? I'm more than happy after the last 18 months to talk about the difference that Ryan Hardy makes to this Argyle side. Um, I I think I should start off by saying because I wasn't on the post Birmingham podcast due to being away um, for the festive break that I thought um, it was an improvement from Ben Wayne in the level of performances we'd seen from him and I think I'd like to touch on something a little bit later when we get into the Cardiff game about Ben Wayne's performance um but we're going to do this in a little bit of a roundabout way because I do sort it sort of took me back to Sheffield Wednesday away last year that first half that we got from Ben Wayne last night and look it's no criticism of him I mean well I suppose it is a form of criticism towards him um (laughs) in a in a silly way of doing it but it was it was an almost impossible task to go up against two Premier League centre backs essentially and ask him to lead the line, to hold the ball up, to draw fouls, to just get us up the field. It was it was such a difficult task. And um Uncle Ryan Neil Hardy has told it. us Well we'll come on to that, Dan. Calm down. Um <laughs> Uncle Neil told us that um he um it was always the plan that Wayne would play the first half and, and Hardy would come on and stretch the game second half. So in a way, I mean, to get in nil-nil at half time, they would have probably seen that as a, a huge win and Hardy was going to come on at nil-nil. Anything could happen. You know, who knows? We might score a perfectly legitimate goal on the 56th minute and take the lead and we might be able to see the game out. But we've touched on that. Um, Hardy gives us such a brilliant option though, doesn't he? I think within two or three minutes of him coming on, he received the ball um in the center circle he laid it off to um i think it might have been randall maybe who then spread the ball to his hours and we got forward and then he drew a foul in the center circle as well and um his link up play with whitaker was excellent towards the end with the chance that whitaker put over it's just such a relief that he's back and it's annoying because after his hamstring injury in the QPR games and the do what was the game before that? Uh, Stoke, wasn't it? But the Stoke City game. Hardy had two chances where it looked like he was going to get back to his goal scoring form after a little bit of a dry patch. And you're thinking if he puts one of them away, we know what a confidence player Hardy is. He could go on a little run again, and we know how helpful that is to the team. So to have him back is great. Um, I would suggest that there will absolutely be no question about who starts up front against Watford on New Year's Day. Um, I'm sure we'll touch on that towards the end of the pod. But um, he just gives us such a great option. He stretches defences. Um, I was under no, I had no doubt whatsoever that the championship would suit him better than than League One just because of the space he's going to get in behind some of these back lines, just because teams are naturally going to play a higher line against us. Um, So it's great that he's back, you know, touch wood that he stays fit and sound and defenders don't headbutt him when he's going for a header um, and his hamstring stays attached to his, his top of his leg. Um, So, you know, fingers crossed you say Sam, but it was also great to see Bundu back on the pitch yesterday as well. Um, I know he didn't, contribute a huge amount i don't know whether that's just me being harsh or whether it's just speaking the truth he didn't contribute a huge amount when he came onto the pitch yesterday but he also gives us a great option of stretching defenses running he runs the channels brilliantly bundu he really does so um two good options there and my you know we all we all like to say a wish at, at christmas time and my christmas wish is that we're able to get some strike reinforcements in so that Ben Wayne can go out on loan to League One and get some game time, get regular minutes, get some goals. Um, and I think we all want it to work, don't we? I don't think anyone's anyone's suggesting for one minute that we don't want the Ben Wayne story to work out. It would be a great story if he, he turns out to be a success. Um, it's just he's being set a nigh on impossible task at the moment at this stage of his career. 
um, to do the job that he's doing. But we'll touch on it again in a, in a little bit when we move the, the discussion on. Um, we are starting to potentially see little green shoots in, in his career, I think. Yeah, and of course, uh, also should mention that Ryan Hardy yesterday scored with a searing, unsavable strike that even a prime Jan Luigi. Well, Bazunu couldn't get to it, could he? Not have Bazunu, Bazunu couldn't get to it. Stranded a mere bystander as the ball rocketed yeah. into the back of the Southampton net. Um, one final question before we take uh, the mandated break. Um, which is that, as I alluded to in my introduction, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was in attendance um, due to his alleged uh, support of Southampton. Um, Sunak, of course, such a big Southampton fan that he made a quip a few weeks ago about Southampton's <coughs> struggles when they were already at that point. John, um, in the unfor unfortunately, sorry to jump in. Um, due to unforeseen cuts to the budget, we're no longer able to continue with this segment, so we, we might have to move on. Money's been saved to be used elsewhere. And that is the form of biting political satire that you can expect on the green and white pod. But um, Russell Martin, uh, him again, um, uh, you know, an annoyingly difficult bloke to dislike, was asked by BBC Radio 5 Live whether Sunak had come down to the dressing room. Uh, and he responded that he may have come down, but I have no interest in saying hello, sir. So finally, a question from me to all of you. Uh, if Rishi Sunak came down to your changing room uh, after a 2-1 win, what would you say to him? Sam, uh, it's a family. It's a family show. I can't. I can't air my views, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, that would be an odd thing to say to Rishi Sunak, but okay, each to their own. Sam, uh, I'd said I'd like to introduce him to some of the Birmingham tackles in in the game from the other week. <laughs> and Dan, no comment. <laughs> and on that bombshell, let's take a break. What was your? What would you say, John? Incidentally, oh, I'm impartial. I'm the host. <laughs> Talk Sport Fan Network. <laughs> advert for some form of fast food company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do they yeah, even yeah, put yeah, the yeah, adverts yeah. in nowadays? I don't know they do. <laughs> and we're back. And it's like we were never away. Because in a real sense, we weren't. Um, so we've already touched on it a little bit. And I don't want to go into so much detail as we did with the Southampton game, given that it was now a few days ago. But we have not been on a pod since the Cardiff game on Boxing Day. Um, a 2-2 draw at the Cardiff City Stadium. We took the lead for an incredibly well-worked team goal. Callum Wright and Ben Wayne both involved. Morgan Whitaker sliding home in the middle. Um, and we looked comfortable. Uh, but then Matt Butcher, for reasons best known to himself, decided to play a sand wedge. Is that, is that a correct golfing term, Dan? Of a back pass no. into his own net? No, probably not. Um, I'll leave the golf analogies. Um, and and Cardiff pulled level out of nowhere. A searing strike in the genuine sense of the term from Carl and Grant put the 2-1 up. But Argyle raced back into the game after that. Sent for the cavalry off the bench. Whitaker speared the ball into the net after a first shot was pushed out by the goalkeeper. And Mumba, that man again, came so close to winning it, hammering the ball off the bar. But Cardiff had their chances too. Um, Dan, you were kind enough to drive uh, Sam, me and a couple of others up from Plymouth on Boxing Day for this one. Um, so I'll ask you to, to give a quick recap of the game and your main takeaways from it. Well, you've done a pretty good job there already of uh, <laughs> summarising the goals and some of the key points. So um, to kind of go into a more... Um, kind of tactical level of it. Um, as Sam touched on earlier, you know, we've, we've gone back to this 3-4-3 uh, idea for the last couple of games. Um, this this came to four um, uh, in the Cardiff game. And I think there were some really um, promising signs of it in terms of us playing out from the back. Cardiff um, were quite a functional team. They weren't kind of very... Uh, a very kind of slick passing team or a particularly high pressing team, which I think suited us because it allowed uh, Plegathuelo, Gibson and Gallo, um, sorry, Plegathuelo, Gillespie and Gibson to have a bit more time on the ball and pick out passes to our wing backs. Now, often our attacks would start by shifting it to Gibson, who'd play the ball to Miller, to have a man close to him, but he, he just was able to kind of produce a really good first touch and just set off down the line and then you know, using his pace and dribbling ability, which we all know he has, uh, we'd beat the press. And time and again, that worked for us really, really well. I think that was a key component of how in control of the game we were for the first kind of half an hour. Um, and it was, yeah, a really kind of um, good performance from us. I think, um, as Joe touched on, it was a bit more like it from Ben Wayne, you know, 
some of the um key issues we have i think with him and his skill set at the minute is yes of course he needs to bulk up we know that but also the ability to just drop into little pockets off the center backs and link up with some of our attacking players and then get us up the pitch that way that's something that hardy does well that's something bundu does well something we obviously know niall ennis did very well it's not something wayne's got in his locker at the minute um but he did show signs of it um on boxing day which was encouraging so um that was that was good to see and I, and obviously his um cross for the for Whitaker's goal was was pinpoint as well so um yeah the first half an hour was really encouraging the goal uh, for Cardiff to equalize is just oh it's just galling i i've seen a lot of criticism for hazard for it um and yes, whilst he does kind of seem to go a weirdly amount kind of out of his goal, I know we encourage, you know, we encourage our goalkeepers to kind of sweep a little bit so we can, uh, they can contribute to our playing out from the back. But he did seem to go a long way out. And also, he's not the quickest in running back, is he? Now that we know that as well, his uh, sprint speed isn't, isn't fantastic. Um, but it's... It's 90% on Butcher for me. He just overhits that pass. Obviously, playing it to Hazard's left foot because he's left footed, he just overhits it massively. And then um, Hazard doesn't quite get back in time. Uh, Cardiff, yeah, had a little purple patch kind of 15 minutes in the second half. And obviously, they scored from a, a bit of a missed kick from Miller, which is frustrating because, you know, he, he was so good at left wing back throughout the game. I think subbing him off unless it was fitness related, was a mistake um, because I just think he gave us such an attacking option and, and so much outlet and, and so much good came from his um, his dribbling. Um, Mumba didn't quite have that same impact uh, for me. Um, so, yeah, it, it was really frustrating to be kind of suddenly 2-1 down when we were so comfortable throughout the first um, a good, good kind of portion of that game. Uh, but then to come back into it again, you know, I think the subs um, were very good. We had quite a bit of firepower off the bench. Um, Luke Cundall isn't so suited to a 3-4-3 for me. I think he's better suited as one of the more attacking players in a 4-3-3. In a um, but in that deeper role against a Cardiff team that was looking to sit in, to be fair, he was very good. Um, and yeah, we, we managed to really pen them back in and, and knock on the door, get the equaliser. And then, goodness me, Ballymumba hitting the crossbar from all of five yards was, uh, yeah, pretty galling. I'm, I'm not sure how he's missed it, to be honest. I know Perry and G sliding in and the keeper's kind of there, but he's got to score, has to score. Um, well, he was so he was it, offside anyway, so. Yeah, probably, yeah. And, um, yeah, so... Yeah, it was a it was a very encouraging result. Another one where you could think, oh blimey, how, we've still not got the away win. We still could have could have got more out of the game. But to go to a team that is okay, they're on the slide, but they're a, a reasonable team at this level, and to outplay them and and come away with a good away point it, it was really encouraging. Um, and I think that the away win it is coming. You know, as you said, we've played a lot of good teams away from home. Uh, we've got some more win winnable away games in the second half of the season. I, th I think it's on the way. If we continue to play like that, um, yeah, we'll be all right, which is encouraging because I thought the Birmingham performance was pretty poor. Um, I thought Rotherham, you know, we toiled against 10 men. So this was a a, a good kind of marker to set um, as we go into the new year for me. Yeah, and I... I would have to say I thought Cardiff were the platonic ideal of a bang average championship side, the most bang average of bang average championship sides, which isn't a huge criticism because I actually personally think that that is an improvement on where I thought they would be at the beginning of this season, although I know a lot of their fans had much more lofty expectations uh, than, than I did for them. Um, yeah, just, just, Sam, just briefly picking up on what Dan said, um, I think we were all, you know, stood together at the ground and were dis quite disappointed at full time because obviously we were right behind the Argyle barrage on the Cardiff goal. And obviously, we, you know, right behind Mumba hitting the bar and, and several other opportunities where it just felt like we didn't get our shot away quickly enough or, or whatever. Um, but I think that initial feeling has subsided for me into thinking this is 
a very good point because actually there were quite a lot of opportunities Cardiff had on the break either to, you know, either, either Hazard making a save as he did right at the end or, or a couple of opportunities where they could have played it better. So how do you evaluate that, um, you know, a few days on being able to look at it in the cold light of day a little bit, a point gained or, or two dropped? Uh, both. Um, I think, literally, um, no, literally about to say you can't say both. Can't say both. <laughs> two, two, two dropped. Then two dropped. Um, I think we. I see what you're saying, but we were the better team in the game for sure. Um, and had a lot more than they did going forward. Um, no, okay, a lot pushing it. We had more than they did going forward. Um, they had. Look, I think we really, really dominated the first half hour, thirty five minutes. Obviously, there was that that um, calamitous error. I would maybe say it's more like 70-30, but we can all probably all agree Butcher is primarily to blame. Um, then, obviously, you know, we, we respond to it not too badly. Uh, we, we, then, we get the ball forward again a couple of times before half time. First 10 of the second half, they come out looking a lot more confident. They smell blood and, and they score again. We can we can do a little bit better um, in a couple of regards. Miller's missed kick, and I think it's um, it's always difficult to tell because we mark zonally. But I think it's Kettle Hayden who's meant to be marking that zone, um, who doesn't quite pick up Grant. So we go two one down. Um, and, but then after that point, we really really built up ahead of steam. Uh, we for the, I'd say for the the ten or fifteen minutes, both before and after that equalising goal, that overall 25-minute spell, let's say, was probably equal best for the, for, for the best spell of that length of have all season. Uh, the only other one being um, maybe 25 minutes before and after half-time in the Norwich home game and the first 25 minutes of the QPR game before the red card. The individual spells of games, we just looked absolutely breathtaking, that Cardiff game was right up there with with both of those two occasions, and that was just a a joy to watch for that twenty five minutes. And the goal came sort of right in the the eye of the storm. So yeah, it's frustrating we didn't get the win done. I think with that Mumba chance, what makes it look worse than it is is the fact that he hits the bar for such close range, because I think he's got to lift it over the keeper because the keeper is making himself really big. I think if the keeper just saves that, we're all saying. You know, it's close range to keep his made himself big. He saved it. So I think actually if, if the keeper saves it, he doesn't get as much stick for missing that. But I think the fact he's tried to lift it over the keeper, which is the right thing to do, but he's lifted it too far over, makes it look like a worse miss than it actually is. I don't actually think it's that easy a chance. I've not seen the XG breakdown of that game, but I'd be surprised having watched it back if it was more than about a point four or so xg I, I think probably that that doesn't go in as often or if not more often it does but it, it's, it's five still very yards out sam how could it be 0.4 xg because it's such a tight angle and the keeper's making himself very it's big and tight angle. It, it's fairly tight and, and 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 the keeper's making himself very big and there's a defender in the way I'm um, not sure all the of them is making himself that big he's just trying to scrabble across anyway i think yeah I think all of those things to me culminate in make, making it a much harder chance than it first looks. Let's let's say that I think it's a much harder chance than it first looks. Uh, look, I'm not, I'm not going to go too far the other way. I'm not going to say it's impossible to score from. Um, it's very much a could score, if not a should score. Maybe it even borders on a should score, but I don't think it's quite a, a should score. It's, it's more of a could score for me. Um, I, I think, but yeah, that, that's a great chance. I think what's just almost as good as a chance is literally about three seconds before when Whitaker puts in an absolute sublime chance across the box, it falls to his abs and his abs just doesn't quite wrap his foot around it, unfortunately. And then it goes out to Mumba, who then has the instant we've just been discussing. So, yeah, um, really fantastic performance for much of that game. Um, I, I, I said before the game uh, on the Christmas Eve pod that we should start Freddie Asaka over Wayne. Um, and all I can say to that is I'm glad Juice didn't listen to me because I think Wayne was really good in the game. I think that's the best. Taking aside, you know, cup games where he's been very impressive, where, where naturally the tempo is a bit lower. You have to take that into account. In terms of league games, that's the best Wayne has played uh, for Argyle for me. And I don't think there's anything that even gets close to it. I thought he was really good in the game. He still had a couple of howler moments like when he just sort of tried to run onto a cross and completely sort of ran into the ball, just mistimed his run entirely, which was which caused 
bit of a, a moan and groan in the crowd. But yeah, apart from that moment and apart from a couple of times he was a bit too easily bullied, I thought he was excellent. He, he ran into space well. He made those runs. He dropped deep when he had to. He, he, his use of the ball at his feet was brilliant. Um, and I think Isaka was, as much as most of the time when he's come on, he has been very good. I think he was a little bit maybe of a ra- rabbit in the headlights when he came on and, and it just sort of um, just stopped the momentum that we had after making that sub. Um, which, you know, he, he did then grow into it and stop his time. He had some good touches. And that's not to criticise him at all. But I think you'd be amazed if you ever find any 17-year-old who plays with any regularity who doesn't have the odd quieter game. That's just what young players do when they're thrown in at the deep end. But yeah, it, it's more to praise Wayne. It's more that Wayne was, Wayne was much better than he, he normally is. I think it's his best league appearance for the club, which makes it all the more frustrating he was then so bad last night. But <laughs> never mind. That's just that's the way he goes. He's, he's you know, he can be a bit like that, unfortunately. But yeah, I think as Joe said, try and find him alone um and 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 get a third striker to rotate slash compete with Hardy and, and Bundu. Um going back to that's that's my take away. And going back to the Cardiff game, yeah, um a point gained, but more so more so two points lost. And I think that was a great chance for the first away win. Um, and, and going back to the, the, the bit that was on the Christmas Eve pod as well, I, I sort of quite confidently went into Ipswich and, Q- and Cardiff saying those were going to be the first away win. And once the first away win hasn't come, I would say those are the two we should have won out of all the away games this season. I think those are the two we should have won. So I'm taking that as a moral victory. If, if Sam goes back any further with his comments, we'll end up talking about Cambridge away from last season. And let's not do that. Um, <laughs> I'd also yeah, just add that in reply to Sam's point, I'd just also say I don't think necessarily it was the fact that Isaka came on for Wayne was the fact that that really stalled us against Cardiff. Uh, I think they made some subs at the same time and it was certainly noticeable how they were like pressing our defence a lot more. Now, because of our either striker that played in that game, uh, we had to be very one-dimensional. We had to try and play out from the back Any time Hazard kicked it long, it was coming straight back, obviously, because it's weighing up against big centre-backs. So we had to try and just play out, keep it on the deck and, you know, beat their press. Now, for the I'm I'm not really sure why they kept it until the last 10, 15 minutes. But from that point, they really started to press our defence more, which meant we found it more difficult to play out from the back. Um, And that meant that they kind of wrestled back a bit of control that way. Yeah, I... um... I did, though, think that the first away win was going to come with the ball flying in off Freddie Asaka's backside, which came very, very close to happening (laughs) right at the end. Um, Joe, I don't don't want to dwell too much more on the Cardiff game, um, but just one question for you on it, which concerns Macaulay Gillespie, who made uh, a rare appearance and I personally thought was absolutely outstanding. I gave him my Man of the Match award, um, not just for his defending at the, the in the center of the back three but also for spraying some unbelievable balls around especially in the first half um but then we saw the other side of him unfortunately was that he went off uh with an injury so um how how did you sort of evaluate his performance and i guess what you know how, how did it sort of illustrate both the potential and and pitfalls i guess of of gillespie yeah. It's one of them, isn't it? You you spend what seventy minutes so pleased and delighted with how he's going, and then the game stops and the camera pans and and the poor lads on the floor again. I mean, he he can't he can't catch a break, can he? Um, I I'm with you, John. I thought he was I thought he was brilliant. Um, we know he's got it in him to to spray those thirty forty plus yard diagonals. And um, am I right in saying it was him who played? Kesla Hayden threw um, in the first yeah. half. I mean that that was just that was just perfect from him. Put it on a you know to coin a golfing term, he's put it on a toadstool from from hundred yards up the fairway. I mean it's it's is a that, fantastic. That is, that, that is, that, is that a more that, accurate one down or not? That, that's, okay, that's an accurate golfing. Well, it's better than a sa- better than saying a sand wedge goes along the ground. But <laughs> we're, we're getting closer with the golfing terms. Good, good. Um, <laughs> It's it's just a, it's a brilliant pass, and you, you're right in what you're saying, John. It, you know, he, he he slotted. What was impressive about this compared to the whole performance from Gillespie was he slotted in on Boxing Day as if he'd been there all season. There was no um, there was no need to get up to speed or anything. It was like he'd been 
playing every minute of every game. Um, they seem to work really well um, as a as a back line as well. Um, I mean, we're we're fortunate in a way, I suppose, that it's been confirmed that it was just cramp, um, and he missed Southampton purely through similar to, I guess, Galloway and, and Miller when they came back from all their muscular injuries. It's just that there's there's a game every seventy two hours, and um, you know when you've been out for so long and you've got cramp, the last thing you want to do is go to the well again. So. Um, I fully expect we will see him in a starting capacity. If not on Monday at Home Park, then he's nailed on to start the cup game against Sutton United. Um, but look, he's um, it's great to have him back because I, I sung his praises all the way through last season about how he was comfortably our most improved player. Um, you know, I I I ate my slice of humble pie halfway through the season that I'd, I'd written him off the season before and he'd, he'd come back and, and prove me wrong with a, a great aplomb last year. And um, I re he's another one. I mean, I, I want it. With, I have this feeling towards all of the group, to be honest. There's there's no, you, you know, I don't want anyone to, to fail at Argyll. And um, there's something about these sorts of stories where Gillespie's been, been taken out of, of the A-League and brought back to English football. You know, you want that to be a success story. You see these sorts of stories at other clubs. It's about time that, that we had these success stories. And, um, you know, he's a good professional. He 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 does his job very well. Um, I'd imagine he's Charlie Rose's nightmare on Tunnel Cam and, and things because he, he doesn't seem to really enjoy the, the fame of the camera being stuck in his face. But um, it, it's great to have him back amongst the group as well because if you, if you re watch all the... Uh, teammates videos and things that were coming out last season gillespie featured quite highly on uh joker or or something or other in the in the dressing room so i think he, he's a in the roy Keane meme about does he do card tricks or things i think he's a great person to have around the, the dressing room so um fingers crossed he gets back out there monday obviously we'll, we'll touch on that shortly but um no solid really solid 65 70 minutes whatever it was at cardiff and uh Hopefully we see plenty more of that in the coming months. Yeah, and I think if we can get to a position finally where we're able to play Galloway one game, Gillespie the next, or, or you know, maybe not that That's rigidly, a little but, win, isn't it? Like that. It, it feels almost almost like a new signing between the two of them. It's not to suggest they're exactly yeah. the same player, but they because they aren't, but they both bring, you know, real solidity to a back line that as we all know is, is like that at times this season um all right then well joe, joe mentioned the watford game so um advancing down the fairway of life and looking over the bunker towards the hole um we will discuss uh watford's game which because uh there's such a tight turnaround between fixtures we're not going to contrive into a separate podcast we're just going to deal with it here um but i will do an aaron hocking voice start by saying watford will be saying goodbye to vicarage road as they make the trip down to the west country um of course we're now entering the part of the season where we're starting to play teams for the second time uh, we got one of our rare away points at Vicarage Road in our first away game back in the championship, a nil-nil draw um, back in August. Um, Watford come down here, a bit of a perplexing side. Certain lower league pundits seem to think they're the second coming of Jesus Christ. The league position they're in does not seem to indicate that, and they took a pretty heavy battering by Bristol City at home um, before failing to beat the championship's biggest club, Stoke City, I believe, uh, in last night's round of games. Um, Sam, how do you see this one going on Monday? Um, I think we've got every chance just because we're, we're at home and our record at home park is absolutely fantastic. They're improving as a team. They were about 20th in October or so, and um, given Watford's approach to management, you'd have thought that Ishmael was soon to be out the door. And I remember seeing a tweet club statement, Valerian Ishmael, and I thought, there it is. And it turned out they'd extended his contract, which was the most un-Watford thing to ever happen. But I think he's shown a bit of faith in that ever since. He, he certainly improved them. 
Yeah, when you, quite it. You, if you if you're associated with Watford and you see a picture of that corner flag on on social media, it usually it doesn't portend uh, good employment news, does it? But um, on that occasion, no, uh, it, did. It, it it did. Considering they were they were quite low in the table, it just seemed remarkable that that, that they'd done that. But they did, and to an extent, he, he's repaid that the faith they've shown. They're now very much in that. Um, if we're talking about what EFL pundits say, seeded batch of teams just outside the playoffs. Um, whereby they're, you know, whereby that awful sort of ninth to about seventeenth is much of a muchness in terms of a congested bunch of teams with a points tally about five points separating them or so. So they're very much in that. Oh, I think they 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 did they have you know only picked up one point out of two over Christmas, uh, but up to that uh, up to Christmas Day they were in really fine form. Um, Ishmael seems to be implementing the style he wants to play a bit more, so I think they will have a sniff of the playoff second half of the season, the way they're going. Um, the game up there was really, really good game, despite the fact that it was a nil-nil. It was a really good game. Both teams went for it. Both teams had one-on-ones. Hazard made an excellent save for us, and um, um, Backman made an excellent save for them from Randall. Um, so either team could have won the game. Um, it was a really good feel-good game. It was our first away game back in the championship, and we went toe to toe with an inferior, much better team, and and matched them, and and got a, got a, what I would say was a deserved point. We've talked about great spells and games, but I think over ninety minutes, that was definitely one of our best away performances of the season. Probably only bettered by Cardiff and Ipswich, maybe, maybe not even Ipswich, but it was a very good West performance. Brom. Um, yeah. West Brom potentially. Yeah, potentially West Brom, but it was it was a very good very good performance. It was certainly in the top third or so of the away games this season, um, and we got a draw that we very much deserved. Um, yeah, um, hopefully it could be as good a game as that, but hopefully with a few goals going in at our side uh, to add to it, um, and I think there's every chance it will be because our home record is so good. We've not lost at home since the Swansea game um, that was seventh uh, of October. Um, yeah, can't argue. Dan, um, obviously we've talked about the sort of system changes that have come in under the caretaker management of Jusnip and Nanskeville already. Um, do you expect the switch to three at the back to sort of prove to be an away from home thing? And, and we might go back to how we set up against Birmingham uh, for the Watford game. Or do you think this this looks like something that, you know, a, a switch that uh, Messrs. Jusnip and Nanskeville just sort of want to do generally and and, and stick with that? Well, yeah, possibly, because it's difficult to argue with our home record, as Sam says, you know, sixth best home record in the league uh, so far this season, uh, 30 goals in 12 games. So it's, it's if it ain't broke and all that, but it would be um, perhaps uh, beneficial to play 3-4-3 in this game, um, you know, uh, try and force their wide players back a little bit if we play wing backs and then just uh, double pivot um in midfield to kind of match with their with their two more advanced midfielders as well um but yeah it, it's a tricky one and it, it probably is a bit of you know how he wants to shuffle the pack you know looking at you know the fact that this is our, our fourth game in i think nine days isn't it and then we've got sutton at the weekend as well obviously of less importance uh than this but yeah so I think we can go either way, to be honest. Um, it's good to have op- defensive options back. You know, Galloway can play left centre-back or left-back, um, which is useful because, uh, you know, if, when we play Miller there, it feels a little bit makeshift. When we play Galloway there, it feels... Um, Gillespie there, it feels a little bit makeshift. Saxon early obviously isn't back yet, um, which leaves us with Edwards and Kesler Hayden as our 2 fullback options. So, um yeah, we've got some flexibility in what we can do. Um, as I said um, uh, earlier on the pod, what I really do like about the the four three three is just the balance of that midfield three of Houghton playing the single pivot, dropping in, receiving the ball, and and having that awareness of a player on his shoulder and playing it out. Um, and then Cundall and Azaz either side of the kind of the two more forward players. Um, just so good at advancing us up the pitch and having that close control and quickness of thought um, to get us out of tight spots and, and advance us. So um, it's a sh- it'd be a shame to lose that going to three four three, but it does have a lot of merits as well. Three four three. So it's 
it's great to have the option of both you know if if we if we're not sure what we're going to do um then you know it makes us more difficult to um set up against as an opposition yeah Watford of course uh, historically you know if if we have merits to that formation Watford historically have had demerits in their formation that's uh, right. a reference that people over the age of uh, 28 or so might get and for the rest of you uh, don't worry um finally on Watford Joe um Dan touched on it very briefly, but what, what do you sort of expect, um, you know, beyond the system? What do you expect in terms of personnel changes? We played a pretty full-strength lineup last night, I thought, but obviously did do some rotation for the Cardiff game. Um, I guess in question number one, what do you expect to see in that regard? Question number two, how would you approach it if you were the boss? I guess you could, on the one hand, say, you know, there's going to be tiredness in the legs after this period. But on the other hand, you could say if the players can just push through this one, you get a comparatively leisurely uh, stretch of a few days, a few days into the Sutton game, and then obviously after that, uh, it's, it's sort of two weeks until the next league game. So, how how would you you know consider approaching that? I think, without knowing his character um, perfectly well, I think Neil Jusnip's quite a competitive um, character. He wants to. You reckon? You reckon? Yeah, he he's he wants everything to be right and. The likelihood is, the probability, if all the whispers about time scales and if everything goes to plan from the football club's point of view with timings of interviews and things, this is likely to be Neil's last game on on the touchline um, if everything goes to how they hope up there. Um, he will want to have a win under his belt before he returns to the stands. Um so I, I don't imagine there will be any sacrificing of this fixture um, selection-wise. He It will be a simple case of he'll go in um, tomorrow or he'll have gone in today and said, right, who's who's ready to, to run through the wall again for us? Um, you know, who needs a bit longer on the on the f- um, fitness table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't imagine I'd certainly be very disappointed if any players were turning around saying I'm I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make this one boss. I think with the the way they've performed so admirably um since essentially everything was turned upside down for them in the space of 48 hours um I think they're all pretty united and, and they want to to be out there as much as they can at the moment. So um, personnel wise, as suggested earlier, I imagine that Ryan Hardy will be the, the go to man up front. Um, I think, um, I think we've performed so well with three at the back. I would potentially be tempted to stick with it, albeit I can fully understand if they go back to the 4 3 3, given you know, as, as the two boys have alluded to, it's got us to sixth in the table and home form. Um, that being said, the Duracell bunny that is Luke Cundall um, must be absolutely chomping at the bit now, given that he's had, what, two yeah, the bunnies, cameo the bunnies, the bunnies chomp at the bit? You're, you're meant to be the horse racing. Wow. You, can, you can have a go at my golf knowledge, but I think that's a bit of a mixed metaphor. <laughs> um, <laughs> put it this way, there's, there's some fresh double A's that are now in his back, ready to go. Um, you know, he's had two little cameo appearances. His legs will be pretty fresh. I, I fully expect him to him to come straight back in. Um, obviously, Jordan Houghton. I think one thing that wasn't touched upon, obviously, Jordan Houghton was ill over Cardiff. Um, I don't think he was perhaps as effective, effective last night at Southampton. I think we can expect an improvement in his performances with that under his belt. Um, no, I'm not going to try and predict the team. I'd imagine... Playing Jewsnip roulette is a lot easier than what Shuey roulette ever was. Um, but I, I really do suspect this will be as strong a lineup as we can physically name. Um, with, as mentioned earlier, the fact that they can then, um, you know, you'd like to think a, a good chunk of the group will then be told, look, you can, you can spend 90 minutes on the bench all being well against Sutton United. Um, you know, we don't want to preempt how that game's going to go, and we're going to talk about it next week. But um, you'd like to think that we'll be able to get through that without having to put all of our ammunition onto the pitch. So um, it'll be interesting to obviously see out of Pleggy and Gillespie who which 
if either of those two, if both or if none of neither of them make it, because that obviously narrows the options down to well, very limited, doesn't it? Really, um, Galloway, Scar, and, and Gibson are the, are the three options. Um, I'd love to get an update on Saxon to find out when he's going to be back. Um, I'm hoping that our good friend Mr. Errington will ask that after Watford on Monday um because he's gonna be like a new signing when he comes back and actually similar to what you were touching on earlier john um in the sense that we'd like to get to a position where we can just rotate macker and and brendan to keep them fit for example we might be able to get to a position where mikhail miller and saxon earlier on a similar basis to keep them the longevity of their seasons going so it's it's an exciting time at the moment for varying reasons really isn't it and this is just another game on the list as as Sam, you know, it's on our patch. It's on us to to really hammer home here why we are so good at home park. I thoroughly enjoyed um the game at Vicarage Road earlier in the season. I must confess I wasn't there, so I had to settle for Argyle TV. But watching that 90 minutes back, I could have watched that over and over again. Because for a nil-nil, there weren't I don't think there have been too many more entertaining <laughs> nil-nils in the championship this season. Um so I fully expect both teams to have a right go again on Monday. Um, Watford haven't had perhaps as quite a fruitful Christmas period um, as other teams. I know obviously they, they suffered a, um, a heavy defeat, didn't they, on, on Boxing Day, I think. And um, they, they laboured to a point at home to the um, second best team in, in Stoke behind Port Vale. Um, so, you know, and they had a man sent off as well, which we shouldn't forget. So they're obviously going to be a man, a man light coming down here, but it will be good. Um, once again, I'm sure when Jewsnip speaks to the media, presumably tomorrow, I guess we'll have a, a pre-match press conference tomorrow. I doubt that Errington will let the club get away with not having one. Um, there will be a, a rallying cry for the Green Army to bring unbelievable noise and i have to say that the atmosphere at times um watching the full replay back after the birmingham game was was pretty intense in the first 10 minutes in particular i think the the camera on that lindhurst side was was almost rattling with the noise inside home park so if we can get a similar atmosphere going for this game then that will really help um but yeah look it's an exciting game as you say with the the schedule it takes a different look after this game as well, doesn't it? Obviously, you've got the Sutton game and then potentially the likelihood is just two league games then in, in January. Um, and without getting, again, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, two very winnable games for, for different reasons. Um, you know, this is an important game. It's We gained a couple of points over the Christmas period. I know what Sam was saying about how the Cardiff performance probably merited more than a point. But at the end of the day, Birmingham and Cardiff in the cold light of day, that was two points gained on on teams in the bottom three. I know we lost one of those points last night. Um, But if we can gain some form of parity on New Year's Day and then build on that in January, you know, we could be in a really strong position come February. So... It's exciting. I hope we play as strong a team as we can. Plenty of players will now have been rested after Boxing Day. So, um, no, it'll be good. Looking for, looking forward to seeing how this one plays out, to be honest. Good matchup. And finally, on Watford, I'm going to ask you all for your score prediction, Joe. Um, oh, score prediction. Uh, 2-1. Morgan Whitaker to get the opening goal. Dan? I think, sadly, we'll just get edged 2-1 the other way. Well, for Christ's sake. Sorry, Sam. Joe. Um, Ruin my New Year's celebrations, I was. <laughs> and um, I, I think we've played Watford after a good run of form are now wobbling a bit. I think we've played well enough in these three games under due slip to warrant more than the results have had. Uh, I'm going to go with Joe 2-1 win. Yeah, and I, I agree with Sam. And I also think that if you look at those other absolutely horrendous decisions we've suffered away from home, the Ipswich game, I believe we won the next game at home to Sheffield Wednesday. The Coventry game, I believe we won the next game at home to Stoke. Yeah. 
Um, I don't want to over-determine that as a factor. But Sorry, I mean, Sheffield, think... Sheffield Wednesday game was before the Ipswich game. The next game after Ipswich was middle spread of free all. Was it? Uh, yes, I've got the yeah. West prominent Ipswich games the wrong way around in my head. Well, yeah. never mind. That analysis can go in the bin. Um, you could also but... say... You could... <laughs> No, John, you could also say about kind of bouncing back from disappointment, because I believe I'm right in saying the game after that awful Bristol City loss was Norwich, Norwich wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we're capable of that for sure. Yeah. And, and also like the Saturday after we've had refereeing injustice go against us is typically just a day ending in Y at the moment. Uh, so, I don't, you know, it's, it's not something you can necessarily attribute too much to. But no, but I think I think obviously the Southampton injustice will be very, very fresh in the mind. We're obviously getting an opportunity to go again immediately, more or less. Um, and I think that, given what we know about this this group of players and the character, I think they'll want to bounce back from from that um, and say put that right. They didn't do anything wrong, but but you know what I mean. I think so. So I yeah, I, I think I'll go for a two nil home win um, for the reasons that I just said and that Sam said as well. Um, just before we go, very very quickly, obviously this will be our last podcast of 2023, which has been just such a phenomenal year as we have discussed all through it. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys. Just in one sentence, what your highlight of this year has been, and you're not allowed to say the Burton or Port Vale games because I think it's very clear how we all feel about those. Uh, and uh, Joe, I'll go to you first. Why me? All right, Sam, um, I'll go to you first. Thank you. You know, you know what it's going to be. Shrewsbury away, Callum Wright, the the best away end limbs I think I've ever been part of. Yeah, say no more. Shrewsbury away, Callum Wright, ninety plus six. Dan. Well, oh blimey, it's 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 very difficult to well on on the basis that you're forcing me to rule out um, Burton and Port Vale, it makes it more difficult. I guess therefore I'll go Huddersfield on the basis that a bit of a sorry Joe, <laughs> a bit of a blimey, we're back. And I think I've touched on this before, John, when I looked at you when we just heard the chant of, you know, we're on our way and it was finished with on our way to the Premier League, obviously slightly tongue in cheek because it's the first game of the season, but oh my God, we're, we're back and it's brilliant. And and that game and Mumba's goal was, was something very, very special. And Joe, you can't escape. Unlike no, Alcatraz. Uh, it's, it's unlike Alcatraz. Um, I'm going to go for Exeter away, although I wasn't there this year, um, with all the pressure that was on it, um, the the way the, the team fought to get that win that essentially almost sealed it for us. Um, Exeter away for me. No, but nobody having Norwich then? I thought that was, no. the, that was the one that was very Norwich. close to Iron Shrewsbury for me, but yeah. yeah. It was close for to me afternoon. as well. There's so many. I mean, the, the Derby home game uh, is up there for me because I have family connections to Derby in particular. And that was just a fantastic night under the under the lights and a, a really important one towards promotion. Honestly, just Whitaker and Mumba signing in the summer and just feeling like a club where young players of that calibre want to be. Um, the Norwich game, as you mentioned, the Huddersfield game, as Dan mentions. But I'm actually going to go for last for yesterday, the Southampton game, which sounds a bit of a strange one because we lost the game in a, in a, in a state of injustice. But... It just really hit me today that this is what it's all about. This is what it's all about, being back at this level. It's going to these big grounds. It's having these great, great days out with, you know, friends old and new alike. Um, and it's and it's taking these teams toe-to-toe -to -toe and coming away from these sorts of games, being able to say, you know what, if we had a terrible refereeing decision go the other way, we'd have probably come away with something against a team who, at the beginning of this year, we're in the Premier League. And obviously, at the beginning of this year, we still had absolutely no idea whether we were going to be uh, in the Championship, let alone, um, you know, where, where teams like Southampton would end up. So I think just as a yardstick of how far we've come and how good a day out it was, even if the result didn't go our way, that's what it's all about for me. So that would be my convenient ending point uh, for this podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, review review of Southampton and Cardiff and look forward to Watford. Um, Aaron, I imagine, will be back in the hot seat whenever he has uh, slept off his um, enjoyment uh, quotient after yesterday evening in Southampton. The less said about which, the better. Uh, let's just say that Southampton pop world probably has never heard the name Luke Cundall chanted so much on the dance floor and probably never will again. Um, and, and probably that's what they're hoping. Anyway, um, 
thank you very much all for listening. Uh, obviously, not just tonight, uh, uh, today, but through the entirety of 2023. Um, we'll see you after the Watford game. But in the meantime, wishing you a very happy new year. Thanks, guys. Happy new year. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.